Hi everyone. In today's video, I am going to be explaining how is the seabed mapped. This simple video will explain how a hydrographic surveyor can map something that they cannot see from a moving platform while floating on a moving surface, all while avoiding the unseen dangers ahead. Mapping the seabed is a challenging task. Most significantly and unlike surveying the land, the surveyor can only very rarely see what they are mapping. The surveyor is actually sitting on a ship floating on a moving surface like the sea while dealing with the ever present danger of hitting rocks, shoals or obstructions at sea while they have to figure out how to map the seabed. In very simple terms, seabed mapping or more accurately hydrographic surveying is undertaken using some type of an echo sounder. An echo sounder works on the principle of emitting a sound pulse in the water, then timing how long it takes for that pulse to hit the seabed and return as a reflection. Let me show you how. Here you will see that a sound pulse will be sent from the transducer of the echo sounder located at the bottom of the ship's hull or ship's keel rather. And from the transducer under the hull, a sound signal or an acoustic signal is transmitted. A timer is started. And then the sound signal reflects the energy back from the seabed. And some of that energy is received by the transducer. And the timer is stopped as soon as the energy is received back by the transducer. Now, given that the speed of sound in seawater can be determined and is normally somewhere in the range of 1460 to 1540 meters per second, which is averaged out to about 1500 meters per second, dividing the time taken to receive the return pulse by two and then multiplying by the prevailing speed of sound gives the depth at a particular point. So we use a standard scientific formula that is distance equals velocity by time. The velocity is known to us. About 1500 meters per second is the velocity. We measure the time using the timer. And then you can see how we calculate the measured depth. The distance is the total distance travel. Time is measured from transmission to reception. And hence the depth of the water or the measured depth is half the distance traveled because total distance is actually twice the depth or twice the depth of the water, right? So the depth of the water is velocity by time divided by two because then if we half the total distance traveled by the wave, we get the depth of the water. Now there are some complicating factors which affect the accuracy of the measurement. The echo sounder isn't on the surface of the water, but is mounted somewhere underneath the ship. So a correction has to be applied. What does this mean as, for example, if the measured depth from the echo sounder is 75 meters, but the depth of the echo sounder under the ship is five meters, then the real depth from the sea surface is 80 meters. Now some forms of echo sounder are actually towed behind the ship and at much deeper depths. So depending on the arrangement, this difference can be significant. The second complication is that tides. Now, while waves and sea swells affect all survey ships, the effects of the rise and fall of the tide are normally more significant. Now, in some areas, the change of depth with tide can be as much as eight to nine meters, as much or more than the draft of many ships. Depths of nautical charts are therefore always referred to a datum, a horizontal plane somewhat lower than mean sea level below which the tide rarely falls. Mean sea level isn't used on nautical charts as 50% of the time, there would be less water than shown on the chart. Instead, depths on charts are referred to a datum that is known as the lowest astronomical tide or LAT. This is the level that the tide only very rarely falls below when there are some strong abnormal climatic effects. The predicted height of tide from the tide tables gets added to the charted depth to tell the mariners how deep it will be actually be at any particular place and moment. For example, if the chart says that the charted depth is 20 meters, 
the Australian national tide tables say that the place in time, the height of the tide will be two meters, then the actual depth experienced by the ship will be 22 meters. The final complication in measurement or depth measurement is the ship's navigation systems. Now GPS gives very high accuracy, accuracy positions. However, some surveys well over 100 years old still represent the best available information, particularly in some remote areas. Up until the 1930s, it was not uncommon for remote features to be as much as few miles out of position compared to GPS positions. So sea mounts in the middle of the ocean often carry warnings on the chart if they haven't been resurveyed since most of them haven't been resurfaced actually. Now there are actually different types of echo sounders. The simplest are single beam echo sounders that point vertically down beneath the ship. The geometry and maths to work out the depth are relatively easy. A high frequency pulse will give more accurate results but not penetrate the water column very deeply while a low frequency unit is necessary to survey beyond the continental shelf but will give you less accurate results. Survey ships achieve coverage by steaming back and forth in a series of parallel lines while running their sounders and recording the results. You can see on your screens here is a single beam echo sounder. In shallow areas, the spacing between lines is measured in tens to hundreds of meters, while in extremely remote areas and on the continental slopes, it may be up to a kilometer between lines. In many areas not covered by systematic surveys, such as beyond the continental shelf, coverage is achieved only by combining the individual efforts of many ships over many decades as they steam across the ocean. In these cases, recorded depths may be many miles apart with scant knowledge of what truly lies in between. To address this lack of knowledge of what lies in between, the latest generation of echo sounders used by many dedicated survey ships are known as multi-beam echo sounders. These shoot many beams of sound from the echo sounder that spread outward and downward in a fan kind of pattern. The echo sounder can not only discern how long each pulse takes to return, but also which direction it came from. Multi-beam echo sounders can typically achieve coverage in one pass up to around eight times the water depth. So in 100 meters of water, the ship can survey up to an 800 meter wide strip in one pass. In contrast, a ship using a single beam system would require anywhere between four and eight passes for the same area before then further investigating the shoals discovered. However, multi-beam systems are much more complicated as they are affected by small errors in sound velocity in seawater, which changes the apparent direction of the beams and hence the apparent depth and position of features. As well as, 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 well as being much more affected by waves, swell and resulting ship motion. Data volumes from a single beam echo sounder are measured in kilobytes per day, whereas data from multi-beam systems is typically measured in gigabytes per day. Examples of single beam and multi-beam surveys over the same area can be found in the fact sheet accuracy and reliability of charts. As a simple analogy of the difference between a single beam and multi-beam echo sounder, picture the difference between trying to rake up the fallen leaves of the ground with a single stick versus using a big fan-shaped garden rake. Using the rake will sweep up far more leaves and not miss any for the same amount of effect. The final system used is one which is only applicable to shallow water down to about 50 to 70 meters. It works in a similar fashion to a multi-beam echo sounder but instead uses light from a powerful laser mounted in a low flying aircraft. You saw that aircraft in the previous screen. The laser scans side to side beneath the aircraft as it flies along, firing at over 1000 times per second. It then measures the difference between a strong reflection of the sea surface and weaker reflection of the seabed. One system is used in the Navy, while the other systems are used by commercial hydrographic survey company. There are a couple of systems around and different systems are used by organizations with different purpose like defense or hydrographic surveys. I hope you found this video useful for learning on how the seabeds are mapped. Mapping the seabed also helps the hydrographic surveyor to construct charts that can be used for safe navigation by mariners and seafarers at sea. Thank you for watching the video. Thank you for supporting the channel. And let me know if you have any concerns, feedback, 
or uh, criticism to pass on i'll be happy to take on that criticism to improve my future videos thanks for watching guys and all the best bye for now